within Germany, I think outside of Germany too, there is just this sense that maybe Love isn't the right man anymore. Andy Robertson at left mid slash left wing back. McTominay is a centre back. Richard Phillison, what has been happening in the Scottish Islands? Instill a sense of pragmatism, instill a sense of the whole is more than the sum of all parts system. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Eurowatch. It is currently 187 days until Euro 2020 21 kicks off. Thank you to Euro's Countdown on Twitter for that fact. And the excitement is building. As ever, I am joined by the wonderful Ritik Sakar. I usually ask Ritik what he has done today, but it's just clicked in my head that he films at 11 a.m. in San Francisco. So he's probably just gotten up eating breakfast. So he's been making up some pretty good answers in the last few podcasts. So, Ritik, what did you get up to yesterday? Well, um, my heart didn't do too well because Manchester United um, gave me yet another reason to double my medication dosage. 1-3-1, one, one, um, and as it's obvious, I'm a Man United supporter. So I spent the rest of the day just cooling off and realizing, yes, we've won. This is a good thing. <laughs> I, I had a heart attack as well. I was watching RB Leipzig versus Bayern Munich, one of the most hectic games of the season. And we have a guest who will know quite a lot about that in a very smooth transition from myself. We've got Tom Fenton from Get German, Get German Football News, one of the most dedicated analysis and news pages I've seen in Bundesliga football and, well, Twitter analysis. We welcome Tom, a heavy contributor to the page, and the GGFN show slash podcast. Tom, how does it feel to be away from your normal co-hosts in a new environment? Um, it's a bit weird, but um, I'm, I'm enjoying it so far. It's good to branch out and try new things. So, yeah, it's good to be here. Thanks for having me. Wonderful. I mean, it's all we can do, uh, all we can do, trying to branch out of our analysis. Now, Tom is here to benefit the discussion of one of Europe's puffing and puffing giants, Die Mannschaft, the German national side. Joachim Lowe's team were recently demolished by Spain, but the DFB, the German FA, reinforced their faith in the manager. And Lowe looks to be taking the Germans to next year's Euros. Meanwhile, Rittig is here as well to put forward a far more hopeful and perhaps underrated nation in Scotland. And don't worry, I'm also quite pessimistic of uh, Rittig's belief in the Scottish team. So, in my preference, we will head to Germany first. Tom, you have the details. You've probably been doing all the research. What has the reaction been to Lowe staying on in Germany? Is it more hopeful or is it now a bit more doom and gloom? Um, I'd say it's neither. It's more just a sense of apathy and um, resignment to what's going to transpire um, next summer. Now, I think, I think previously there was there was still a, a faint hope that he could get things back in the right direction. We saw that he really transitioned the side from you know elder statesmen guys who carried them to their World Cup in 2014 towards a new generation. You know, he basically barred the likes of uh, Thomas Müller and. Jerome Berting from the um, national setup, yeah. and um, and it seemed for a while to be trending in the right direction. I mean, if you just looked at the results, you'd say, okay, this is a team that are, that are getting back to where they should be. But just under the surface, you saw the performances, you saw some of the personnel weren't really performing. There were still a couple of areas where you, where Louv didn't seem to find balance in terms of the fullbacks and didn't really know who he wanted to go for, and um, just a few cracks began to appear even before the. You know the the Spanish um, six nil mauling. So uh, within Germany, I yeah. think outside of Germany too, there is just this sense that maybe Love isn't the right man anymore. Maybe that the game has passed him by in a similar way that pe people assumed that of Mourinho a few years ago and how wrong we were there. But um, it seemed as if Love, yeah, the game's just passed him by a bit. And whether it's a case of that he can't get the best out of these players anymore, whether it's a case of stale tax tactics, which I tend to side with more. Um, it just isn't working, but Germany are too far down the rabbit hole now to even consider um, changing managers at this late stage. They really do just have to, you know, stick with him, give him the backing, give him one more tournament because in a, in a tournament format, he does have good pedigree and, and, you know, he can get the best out of his team there, um, at least historically. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's just a case of, you know, Germany having to, you know, stick with him because they've gave him their word, and um, they have to just hope that the Spain result is a blip. Um, but if you were looking at the performances for the past couple of months, I think you'd see that this is a, this is a bit of a trend, and that would be perhaps um, a bit worrying heading into next year. You've just actually outlined one of the, one of the points I was going to ask you. Actually, if he, if Lowe's shown that this is 
not just a blip. And you're right to bring up the form, Ritik. I'm not sure if you've seen. But, um, since the World Cup, I have it here. Germany have lost four games out of, I believe, over 20. And they've won the majority of them. But as, as Tom, you brought up the, the performances. I remember watching Germany recently in against Ukraine. And in both performances, they were giving up a lot of space uh, in between their defenders. And I think that, that was really true in the Spanish performance. I remember watching it completely flabbergasted. I believe the first two goals came from set pieces. And it was it was yep. schoolboy stuff. Just kind of it was watching some like you said, some of the best players in around in and around Europe just getting completely embarrassed. And I I think I think I've I've remember seeing quite a lot of things about y- Yogi Lowe. I know um, I'm a big fan of Football Daily, and I remember watching a Patrick Van Straten clip of him slamming him, saying he's a terrible manager. Clearly, the troops have put him in bet- in between, but it. It is making me wonder what how, where they are going. What what direction do you think they're going in? Because I know I, I've been looking at some of their uh, lineups. It seems Werner and Nabry tend to stay up front. They haven't really got a, a recognised stri- striker apart from Waldschmidt. What have you made of their their play style and their tactic? Yeah, it does seem a bit muddled. Um, I think it, it's really weird with with Love because you have to respect his pedigree and what he's achieved, and the fact that he could take this. Essentially, you think about think about 2014, and, and and you see a load of Bayern players, a load of Dortmund players, and we've seen with with Spain has, uh, previously trying to merge. You know, when you have got two big rivals trying to get them all on the same hymn sheet, playing together, playing for like a greater cause, it's not the easiest thing. So, I think I'd argue that Löw is very good at getting the best out of the players on an individual level, and maybe being a bit of a, a motivator and a good man manager. But maybe on the tactical side, he's just lost touch a little bit. Um, there's no doubt that these players were helped by the, by their club managers. Um, you know, you think back back then to Klopp, um, to Heinkes, um, obviously to Guardiola later on, um, and 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 the German team just kind of functioned in in this way that was not always spectacular, but just yielded results. And you can argue that you know up, up until the Spain game, they were doing a similar thing. They were just winning by by any means necessary. But I think the the points you make about schoolboy defending and leaving a lot of space, those are the worrying signs where you look at them and you, and you go, this isn't just about um, players who aren't motivated. This is more about actually a system that isn't functioning properly because these, when you've been with the manager for that long, I don't think it should be the case that there should be that kind of defending at corners where players just aren't putting their head in. There's no sense of like marking or players, you know, space all over the shop. They don't know whether they're pressing and there's gaps in between midfield and defence. And, yeah, it's it's been a bit strange to be honest. And again, he doesn't really know what his best eleven is. I don't think. I think he's got a rough idea of it. But you know, is Werner a nine? Is is he a winger? Where's Kevin Volland? Who's playing brilliantly in France? Waldschmidt. I'm a bit. I'm a big fan of him, um, but he's still quite young and raw. Um, so yeah, I just it, it's really difficult to put your finger on where it's gone wrong. Yeah, yeah. And who's the main culprit? I, I, w- I would say I think it's all trending in the wrong direction. Um, but with the personnel they have, because he even, you know, you, you look at some of their more senior players like like Tony Cruz, and I don't think he's playing particularly well at the moment either um, for, for the you know, national for the national team. Um, mm. And so, yeah, I, I think unfortunately it's it's trending in, in the bad direction, and they may get a bit of a uh, yeah, it might not be pretty next summer. I think that that's all I'd say on that. Um, yeah. But you know. I, I... Yeah, I, 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 I'm really feeling it as well. I think I've been feeling it for a long time, the German national team's trend. But in the opposite sense, and definitely the opposite sense of the system, Scotland, Britic, they've, they've had a very clear system. It's three and three slash five at the back. Andy Robertson at left mid slash left wing back. McTominay is a centre back. Britic, fill us in. What's been happening? Uh, well, uh, it, it all sort of um, starts again around about March 24th when um, Alex McLeish was relieved of his Scotland duties and Steve Clark had taken over. You know, both are former Villa managers, both are known uh, commodities, and Steve Clark sort of came in um, to instill a sense of pragmatism, instill a sense of the whole is more than the sum of all parts system, make a team that has decent foundations and is hard to beat. And in the beginning, it did not seem like that at all. Yes, they had beaten Cyprus in the Group I of the um, you know qualifying match. That was Clark's first game, and they played a largely a four-three-three or a four-two-three-one. And 
his first eight, his first nine games did not look good. He had five losses and four wins. But at this point, Scotland had to roll the dice and say, well, we can't put in someone else and, you know, have them really uh, take time to get up to speed. Yes, those losses also included games against uh, Belgium. Uh, but it was it was it was not something that you know was expected of them. It wasn't something; uh, those results weren't uh, entirely unexpected. But what came with 2020 was a different approach, as you had mentioned, the back three and the back five, um, and the confluence of facing slightly, I'll admit, weaker opposition in the rest of their qualifying games. Uh, they played San Marino, who they duly thrashed six 0 beat Cyprus, beat Kazakhstan, um, drew with Israel, and then beat Israel, Czech Republic. Serbia, um, I think the Czech Republic again, and uh, Slovakia, which all led to two final games um, on penalties. And this is where Scotland's grit was really shown. And, you know, they, they line up in a sort more unconventional manner to the way a lot of their players play. And this has been a recurring theme we found out when we were discussing England and as well when we were discussing Portugal to an extent is a lot of these players are playing in formations and not used to playing in um uh, in uh, their respective domestic leagues. And uh, the back three seems to be more in vogue, but this is a very strange back three. You have um, you have Liam Cooper at Leeds, who's not really the most imposing figure, but who's flanked by uh, Kieran Tierney of Arsenal and, oddly enough, Scott McDominay of uh, Man United. Um, and they've had this more unconventional back three system, which in theory is supposed to carry the ball a lot faster, um, get the ball um, you know, to the likes of um, Andy Robertson on the uh, on wide on the left, or maybe get it to McGinn in the center. Uh, but here, here's where I'll say something that um, something quite uh, controversial in, and I'm not sure how Tom would react, is that Scotland do have one thing that Germany do not, and that's a very clear, very vocal, very robust leadership figure in Andy Robertson. He's taken, he's taken this... Uh, you would agree with that. I would agree because with that. this is this is this is something which I've seen uh, lacking in Germany is the lack of someone to take the game, um, excuse my language, by the balls, and um, really um, either lead by example or lead lead by vocality. And we saw this in the last World Cup when um, you know you didn't have the likes of Lucas Podolski, you didn't have the likes of Philippe Lam, um, and Manuel Neuer is obviously stuck to the goal. Um, he can be a loud person if he needs to, but on the pitch there seems to be this lack of someone you know that's a, that's for a really lack of interesting point you brought up there actually because like uh, tom you mentioned it as well I'm just gonna reinforce it the fact that germany they they basically ousted i've got the three players here jerome bird saying thomas muller and hommels as a bit to try and drive the team in a bit more of a youthful mm-hmm. direction but maybe that I'm, I'm, it has worked in terms of i'm guessing you give germany given like plays like jonathan tarr and um, robin cock of leeds a lot of minutes maybe that's limited them on the pitch of leadership it's before you continue because you're doing a great job do you think that's a i think that's a fair criticism then tom i do yeah i think um there are people that on the pitch who will grow into that role i look at joshua kimmich um who is a wonderful talent and he and he really you watch him play and he's very emotionally involved vocal for his age i think he'll grow into that and almost become like a philip lam figure in years to come but he isn't quite in that senior position yet um and it, it's actually some some even argue the inverse, which is that the the the, the leadership of of say Neuer and Goal is almost too overwhelming. Some see him as a bit of a toxic figure for the younger players coming in that they feel like they can't relax and be themselves because they have this imposing man behind them who's been there and done it and lambasts them all the time. So we don't really know. We can't go into the camp, you know, Netflix style and 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 see exactly how this unfolds. Um, I, I think it's difficult to say. I, I do think that you either go completely in a new direction uh, and ditch the past, or you try and do a merger of the two, and, and maybe you keep a few of the guys like Muller around, even if they're just there for morale and for leadership. Um, but what he's doing at the minute doesn't seem to be working very well because I don't think Cruz is a particularly good leader. I don't think Neuer is helping the situation at all at the minute um, yeah. because he seems like a, a figure on his own fighting against this younger group who are trying to take the team forward and. Yeah, it, there's a big clash there between generations and between players who've been there and done it and players who want to stamp their own authority and make their own legacy. So I, I think I'd broadly agree with it. I think there is they are devoid of, of uh, you know what it is? They're not devoid of a leader because I think Neuer is still that. They're devoid of a leadership group. You know, you hear this word leadership group a lot and I think it really is important. You need a core 
a core yeah. of players. Who, it's not yeah. just one. You look at Liverpool. You look at you know they, they haven't got just got Henderson. When he's not there, they've got Van Dijk. They've got James Milner. You know they've got guys like that who can inspire the team and, and really be a group and a core and players that you turn to in need. And Germany don't really have that. It's almost like Neuer's fighting against the tide and he's the last one standing. And I, I don't think that's particularly useful. That's an interesting point because I remember um I re- I remember I've read a Das reboot by Rafa Hongestein. That's an overall uh, outlook on how Germany ended up winning the 2014 World Cup. And one of the big things that Jurgi Love done then was he he took along an injured Sami Kadira who mm-hmm. was unlikely to even play a single minute, and he took him along purely because he was such a big character in the dressing room. So maybe that that change of approach sort of cost him. But then if we're talking about sort of unorthodox uh backroom staff as well in in terms of scotland i was looking at i wanted to ask you you've mentioned steve clark he came in in may 2019 or march 2019 sorry tom get this scotland also have john carver as an assistant the former newcastle manager and malky Mackay as the <laughs> academy manager and then you've got like you said andy robertson as like a left mid slash left winger who's a main source of ball progression but it's like it's so unorthodox do you do you really think they're Scotland have a big chance next year because you you mentioned they narrowly went through on penalties to Euro twenty 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 one. How much of a chance do you reckon they? I'll got take no going? slander of Malky Mackay on this podcast. You take that back. <laughs> no, but um, in all seriousness, I would say you know, barring North Macedonia, uh, Scotland are coming into the Euros maybe as the weakest team. And this could maybe work in their favor. As you see in their group, they have uh, got England, Croatia, and uh, the Czech Republic, I believe. Alex, you can correct me if I'm wrong there. You know, this is obviously not the group of death that Germany have to contend with. But in the balance of probabilities, yes, it's seeming unlikely that Scotland will do much with it, but you have to realize this is the first time in 22 years that they're playing a, an international tournament. Scott McTominay was just born when they played uh, in England 96. And what that gives you is this, you have people and characters who really come alive when the big stage is there. I mean, you look at Germany, you look at someone like Lucas Podolsky, you know, maybe didn't play the best for Arsenal at times, maybe didn't play the best for Cologne at times. But you put him you put him in a white jersey and he is there. He is fit. He is firing. He will do whatever is needed for his national team. It's a, it's a different kind of feeling that comes up. And I saw this quite evidently in their games against Serbia and in their games against Israel. Is that sort of more coming together? As a unit, Scotland can be very difficult to really find your rhythm against. Uh, they press fast with the likes of McGinn. The you know people like um, obviously Andy Robertson just come out um, um, firing out of the left wing, um, get the ball into a line, uh, uh, lined and dykes of QPR, um, and there's there seems to be this l- larger understanding that ironically is coming through a formation that none of them are used to, and. Um, what Scotland don't have is a lot of players playing in the highest tier of English football. They have players playing in, well, they have players playing in the Scottish League. They have players playing in the Championship. They have some in the Premier League. It's 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 a bit of a mishmash when you consider the levels that all of them are regularly playing at. But, you know, you see people like um, Callum Gregor of Celtic. You see people like Landon Dykes of QPR. You see these um, people, even uh, Liam Palmer on uh, the right midfield, uh, sort of the opposite to um, Andy Robertson, you're constantly running in those parallels. Schoolyard stuff that you expect people to do when it's done right, it's a thing of beauty. And it, it all seems that when they play for the national team, it doesn't matter where they're playing for regularly, they will come together. And they've reached a good set, they've reached a good bit of form right before, but you know, given the group, given even if they get through to the group, the next stage, it's unlikely that you're uh, we're going to see more of um, Scotland, but they have this, you know, this guilted opportunity right now. You're playing a national tournament. Tell you what, that's quite interesting. Give it all you've got. The way you're Quick speaking, out. it's actually, it, it's giving me flashbacks to Euro 2016 and Wales's overperformance. Obviously, they, they relied quite heavily on Gareth Bale from what I remember, but I, what I do remember for sure is that their team was, completely built on spirit and organization and just having a collective group of individuals working towards the same goal with such intensity really had benefited them so i'm leaning a bit more heavily towards scotland but tom 
<laughs> surely Germany are in for a tough ride. They're in the group of death. They've got Portugal, they've got France, and they've got Hungary. Yeah, I think um, I think Germany might struggle. Um, you look at the the talents in that group, and you look at the teams they're facing. I, you know, I think France are are still the best team in the world right now. Certainly the best team in Europe. Um, the depth of talent they have. The players who can just come in um, if somebody's injured, they're just all over the pitch. There's immense talent. Again, you see what Olivier Giroud is doing in the Premier League at the minute. And and just on form, I mean, there's few better... In, on his day, I think there's few better at what he does, the way he can bring teammates into play, the way he can link up. His finishing is still superb. And then all the talent around him um, that complements that. So they're in a good position. I think Portugal's attack is frighteningly good at the minute. You know, they've still got Ronaldo. They have Diogo Jota, who, again, one of the form players um, in the Premier League in Europe right now. Um, and they have Bruno Fernandes, um, who, I mean, you know, it's just you run out of superlatives. He's practically God. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it's hard to argue against that at the minute. And I just see that attack. And I, I look at the way that, Port, that uh, Germany defended, sorry, against Spain and the, and the space they, they left and the high line. And you just think that is awful against Portugal and it's awful against France. And even Hungary, you look at some of the young players coming through, um, coming through their system, and, and it's a similar thing. And, and they're going to be tested. So, I think what favours them is if we get crowds back, and I know, I know that's a big if. Um, but they should be playing all their games um, in Munich. Obviously, we have no idea. It might just be in one country, so that might be irrelevant. But that could be potentially useful if they stick by, um, you know, by, by the, the the pre-planned, um, you know, uh, where the st- where the games are going to be played. Yeah. Um, but I, I just, I definitely don't think they're going to win the group. I think they may struggle to get out of it. I did um, have one question, yeah, though, Tom, it, and this is more concerning Germany's personnel. I run into your argument about their tactics. Is their fullbacks? Hmm. Um, I know yes. they've um, they've flip flopped on a on a few options, both between the right and the left back. Now, given if um, uh, given if um, Yeshua Kimmich comes back fit in time, um, who do you think in the fullback positions provides the most to an overall game? This is defending and attacking because this is somewhere where I can't really pin down one or two people. I think it's really difficult to say. Um, like you say, there's no standout number one figure who you go, yeah, definitely him. Um, I mean, it really depends on the style of play that they want to utilize. They've been experimenting, you know, Philip Max and uh, I don't know if you know, but Berthe Baku. Uh, now, now at Wolfsburg, yeah, he went there from Mainz over the summer. Quite a low key transfer. Not many people were were talking about it, but he's been rewarded for his good start to the season. You know, twenty two years of age, plenty of promise. But you just think, is he ready for starting for Germany at right back? Um, is Philip Max ready to start at Germany for you know a start for Germany at left back? I think when it comes down to it, he might opt to go for the more experienced. You know, Marcel Halstenberg. Um, Lucas Klosterman, you know, the, the two RB Leipzig players who, and, you know, they can play in the three in defence or they can play wing back. Well, you could throw Robin Gosens into the mix. You know, he's had a really good uh, last two years with Atalanta. And I really feel that he could uh, provide that more dynamic presence on uh, the left wing, uh, be, be it adds a left back or a left wing back, you know, just to give Germany that little extra bit of talent and incision on maybe the left side. Exactly. And he's an interesting option because he's very good going forward and, you know, pain, uh, but he's still quite raw. So I, I don't know. I don't know if Yogi Love will, will favor that. Let's head into our final predictions then. So Germany, in their group, as we said, they've got France, Portugal and Hungary. That is undoubtedly the group of death. Ritik, first of all, before we head to our expert, where do you, what do you think for Germany? What's their best outcome? As far as Germany goes, I think they will make it to uh, the stage beyond the groups. Um, I say this as a caveat because um, there is a chance they won't make it past uh, uh, France and Portugal, but they could come in as the best place third side. Uh, it's hard to say, you know, given their form and given uh, the competition of their group mates. However, Germany have a lot to prove. I don't think a second consecutive group round exit is in the cards for them. And once they reach the knockout stage, you know, Jogi Liv's record has been very, very good. And it's going to be incumbent upon the players to really you know, punch above their weights and show that there is more to this German team than form suggests. I see them reaching the quarterfinals, maybe n- don't have the talent and incision to go beyond that. Tom, I, you might be out of a job. 
if you were to say Germany uh, leave the group stages. However, I'll, I'll leave you with the final bit of information to make your prediction. So if Germany do finish third in Group F, then they are likely to face one of the Netherlands, Ukraine or Austria. And after that, it's a possible between Turkey, Denmark, Russia, Wales. It's not too difficult. In fact, if they were to finish second, they arguably find probably find a more difficult pathway. So bearing that in mind, but also bearing in mind what we've discussed, you know, all their different frailties. What do you think? What do you think will happen with Germany? I predict Germany will probably struggle in the group. Um, France and Portugal are two very difficult opponents. And um, I think certainly in the case of France, it's going to be a very, very tricky game. Portugal, very impressive attack. And it could be quite an open game. So I think they can get a win against Hungary and, and who knows from there. But yeah, I can't see them getting any better than third, maybe second. Um, and if they can, you know, get... If they can get third and get enough points, maybe they can get through to a to a semi final. Um, but I think my destination, uh, the exit point for Germany, in my opinion, would be probably the quarterfinals. Um, at that point, I expect a Belgium, a France, um, you know, one of the big teams then to to put them out because they're not looking like they're in a good position. Good position. Head into Scotland quickly, Tom. Before we head to our other expert, what what do you think is going to happen with Scotland? Could do you give the nation any hope? I think they can do a bit better than many are predicting. Um, they've got the kind of team and style under Steve Clark, very defensively solid, that is kind of tailor-made for tournament football. Um, and if they can bring their A game, keep things sure at the back, uh, they've got really good leadership, a good leadership core in that team. Um, and yeah, and if they can keep things tight uh, and just nick the odd goal here or there, I think they can also get third and also give themselves a fighting chance of getting through to the courts. It's just like... Um, Ireland and Wales did in 2016 so yeah I think they've got good grounding and they're in a good position to be able to to at least get off the bottom of the group um, but as for Germany I think I think they could be in for a tough tournament and this could be a big wake-up call but again who knows it very much depends on personnel on who turns up on if a couple of senior figures come back um, but at the moment at the moment it doesn't look very good and finally our Scottish expert for the day, all the way from San Francisco, Rittick. What do you think will happen for the Scots? Scotland, uh, I know I am the person who's been advocating for them. However, uh, being possibly the worst team after North Macedonia, I don't see the Scots really transferring um, beyond this group. They are a gritty side. They're a hard side to break down in certain extents, and they can, you know, play for the longer game. But in the group stage, once the 90 plus injury time hits, that's it. There are no penalties to play for. I could see them getting a victory off of maybe the Czech Republic um, or possibly even England. There's a lot of uh, national pride at stake. However, I don't see them making it beyond the groups, and I don't think they'll be the best third place side. I think group exit is on the cards for them. Okay, take into your considerations, guys. I think Scotland's going to have to go third place for now in Group D, but Germany, I think the same as well. We'll go we'll go for, third place in Group F, and that's our official Eurowatch predictions. It's been a delight to have you guys, particularly you, Tom. You've been fantastic. But before we head off, I've got a little teaser for the listeners. Now, I've been listening to Le Bourgeois recently, the official Ligue 1 podcast, and I have a little game of Guess Who to get the, the audience involved. So I thought I would nab that and paint it with a Euro 2021 theme. So, everybody, I'm thinking of a European player, and I'm going to give you three hints to guess it. I was subbed off in the knockout stages of Euro 2016, as my team were beaten by France. I have since played across England, Italy, and now I am home in Germany. At my current club, I play with someone from Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. And those are your free hints. You have until the next episode editing and posting to guess those hints. But once again, guys, it's been a delight. Bye-bye.